Um, so I'm Jenna Levin. Um, I'm a physicist most of the time, my day job. Um, and I also write books. Um, and I work at Barnard and Columbia in New York City. I'm very excited to be here, actually. I, I was a philosophy major um, at one point in college. And then I had a physicist come visit the classroom and um, started discussing physics. And I became completely enamored of how powerful that was and how quiet the philosophers got. <laughs> um, so no offense to philosophers. I'm still very sympathetic to philosophy. Um, but I did say over at lunch when we were talking about this that I'd be very excited to have um, some deep sort of intuition falsified um, really just by a philosophical argument. I'm open to that. I don't feel I've had that experience. I've definitely had a deep intuition falsified by a mathematical argument <laughs> and had to, you know, um, swallow that bitter pill. But I would, I would be very open to that. I sometimes feel that in philosophical arguments, I, I'm simply sparked by something that already speaks to something I believe. Um, and it helps me frame it better. But I would like to see a bigger shift. So I'm very excited to hear from the compatibilists in particular at some point. Were you cutting me off? Is that like when people talk too long, you start applauding? No, no it's just because that's the thing. I said I'd be willing to change my mind about it, that I am a compatibilist, but I'm willing to change my mind away from it. OK, well, so let's swap places. <laughs> no, I'm done. Thank you. Thanks what for having me here. Compatibilist is someone who thinks that it's simultaneously possible to say that the world just obeys laws uh, and they're completely impersonal and disteleological, and yet it makes sense to talk about free will. So that's compatibilist in the context of a particular controversy of free will. Free will. Yes, it yes. It's, a, it's a doctrine that owes its origin to Hume, who argued that determinism is perfectly compatible with free will. Yeah. Okay, that's all I need to know. It's within the context of the free will yes. argument. Yes. 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 You yes. could no. be compatible between all sorts of things. Sure. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's not a general <laughs> philosophical stance for the world. Expect me to abuse philosophical terms liberally. Yes. <laughs> uh, and before I forget, Richard, are you? would you like to join us for dinner tonight? You can I'd love to, yes. Uh, good, then my work here is done. Terry is our boss for the Senate. All right, I'm very compatible. <laughs> and I, will, uh, I would like to sort of open up the question to the big compatibilism, bigger than what, what Richard was sort of poking at. I think that there's lots of issues to be dealt with here. Um, uh, supposedly, uh, from what I heard this morning, everything is going to come on the table this afternoon, and I'm going to have to deal with it. Um, everything was put off till this discussion, apparently. Evolution, emergence, all the things that are interesting to me. Um, so I obviously am not going to be able to cover this or even set up the argument well at the beginning. Um, I want to begin uh, with a couple of things. First of all, the question I'm going to ask is, what actually fits in naturalism and what doesn't? And how do we decide what doesn't fit in naturalism? Uh, because that's what, that's what our, our question this morning was about. And Alex made a strong claim that there's some things that absolutely do fit and other things that absolutely don't fit in naturalism. Uh, I'm not sure how to adjudicate those things that don't. I don't know what they're like, what their features are that wouldn't fit in naturalism. And so my own view uh, is, is very compatible in the bigger sense. That is, I think um, that we've made a mistake by getting rid of representationalism in, in, bio, in, in psychology, that we've get, gotten rid of too early a kind of teleology and biology. Not that evolutionary processes are teleological, but that organisms uh, have indirectedness, and that indirectedness matters. And I'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, uh, the other worry I have here, and this is a, a term I get from Dan, this idea of what, I, what, what he is called greedy reductionism. Um, now, I, I consider everything I do to be reductionist. And I'm very much, I find that there's, there should be no problem with reductionism. On the other hand, I, I actually think that meanings are causally efficacious in the world. And that, there, that you can't do a good job if you just have our current state of very, very reduced physics, quarks and gluons and their relationships or whatever. Um, that, in fact, I think the way we need to do is to begin to think about the physics of dynamical processes, relationships. And I think what we've learned from complexities, theories, beginning with Philip, Phil Anderson and others, that there is a lot of ways to talk about physical processes in which the dynamics, the organization of things matters. And so part of the, the game I want to play today is to set things up in which we stop thinking about bottom-up and top-down causality. 
So I actually think that there's a mistake in, in laying out the world this way. I don't think there's such a thing as top-down causality, but I am also antagonistic to what I would call bottom-up causality. I think causality mostly is talked about at whatever level, whether it's the very low level or the upper level, in terms of uh, organization, or you might say the organization of dynamics. That is, there's structure, and that structure determines what happens and what doesn't happen, what's constrained, what's not constrained. Uh, and in fact, the term constraint is very important for me because I think it helps us get out of that game of thinking that there's ultimate stuff that does all the work. I think that the work is mostly done by the constraints. Now, one way to think about it is that you know, the laws uh, say this is what can happen, but what happens in the real world is what can happen is in a constrained context. And those constraints matter. And they determine what does happen, not just what could happen. And so part of what I want to get at is that. And what that basically says is that means, and this is my defense of emergentism. It's not like there's something from the top down that's controlling things. Or that it ever it works out that way. But when new forms of dynamical organization show up in the world, there are new causal consequences. That is, that weren't there before. And I think the fact that we're sitting here chatting at this table wouldn't have happened you know, 10 million years ago because there are new causal consequences in the world. Uh, and uh, one that happens. One proposal might be to stop, instead of using the word levels, use scales. Yeah, that's, that's levels, good. Because levels automatically sort of Yes, yes, you're right. You right. This, right. I think that's, that's, a, that's a good answer there. So, so part of what I want to do is to say, look, the greedy reductionist move is to say, no, we, there is no upper, upper level, any causality up, at upper levels. We're all going to be able to reduce it down. And what I want to say is I think at the very bottom level, and one of the problems with quantum physics as I see it as an outsider, is that it's... In fact, it's all about a kind of dynamics, even a statistical dynamics. The causality isn't in stuff. The causality is in the organization. And if it's in the organization at the bottom, it's got to be in the organization all the way up. When there's new kinds of organization, we have to think about causality different. And that's not emergence in the classic sense. And I, and I want to be clear. I think that we have to get, out, get away from the top-down, bottom-up antagonism about emergence that I think we want a completely reductionistic understanding of the world, but one that doesn't throw out the levels, these level scales of dynamics that show up that are novel. And I think they play a major sorry, causal role. Just to get you started, you set levels? I'm sorry, you set a level? Scale. scale. In our book, we, we, right, we, right. we yeah, don't yeah. talk about levels. Right? I would urge that we talk about levels and not scales, because <laughs> okay. um, I think that's the issue. I don't think that the reductionists think that things are the way they are because of things that are small. Right. I think we think they, there are things are the way they are because there is a fundamental level of truth which uh, determines everything at, at higher levels. And uh, I would insist on the word level, not scale. Well, that there's a real substantive argument there. Yeah, yeah, I think you're it. Are we interrupting? You? I'm happy to be interrupted. So. Um, well, I'm just wondering if you have, um, you know, just a simple example of, of, something, uh, of, of something that has new consequences that can't be recast in terms of underlying consequences. No, so can't. Like the, temperature is emergent. That's no, no. I'm, so, what so, what, I, what I'm going to go next to is what I think is one of the interesting points. I mean, there's a lot of philosophical talk about mind and, and meaning and intentionality and consciousness and stuff. As a biologist, I'm interested in uh, the problem of the origins of life. Uh, and my, my view of the origins of life is that uh, there is a kind of a phase change going on there. Um, I, I love the beginning of the last line of Darwin's origin, uh, in which he says, there's grandeur in this view of life with its several powers having been breathed into one form or many. After that, evolution follows. The question is that Darwin was unwilling to even talk about was, you know, what are those several powers? What, how did life start? And we're all, you know, obviously uh, m myself and, and Richard, we're really interested in that question because, in fact, the origins of life did not evolve. Life emerged, and then evolution by natural selection is possible. The question is, what are the several powers, so to speak, that make an evolutionary process po possible? I think they're interesting, and I think it's an interesting problem for another reason. The origins of life had necessarily to be a simple origin. That is, they couldn't be really complicated. I, I don't think there could have been really complicated macromolecules involved in this. Uh, I think it had to be much simpler than that. But what's interesting is it's a phase transition. So what's, I think, exciting about the origins of life 
it's both simple and provides us with a remarkable transition in which things work very differently. So when you use the word phase transition, are you speaking literally? No, no, I'm not. I'm not. I'm speaking, you know, so... I think you secretly are speaking literally. Oh, secretly. Okay, well, you know... I, you might not even know it. I think it literally is a phase Okay, that's, that's fine. I, I, I'll, I'll take it any way you want. <laughs> so, the response yeah. that this... I mean, what does it mean to have a phase transition, ice versus water, that when you poke it, it responds differently? Yeah, yeah. So you got a uh, you know pile of chemicals on the floor, a few kilograms. You poke them, and they're not alive. It responds differently than when you poke them when you're alive. Right, That's right. a phase transition. Yeah, all right, all right. Th 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 whatever you want to call it. That's fine with me. Um, my my point is there that I think with the origins of life, we have the very beginnings of what we would call indirected activity that you don't find in other kinds of chemistry. There's a kind of indirectedness there. Uh, and we catch it by two things, and I, I, I go back to Schrodinger, uh, because I love what happened in his argument about the, about the nature of life and what is life, because he brought out two things. I mean, he talked about lots of details that, that physicists were, were interested at the time, the size of, of, the, of the message and so on. But what he was saying is that there's two really crucial problems. One is the problem of information, and that, that he described as a, a aperiodic crystal problem. Uh, and the other problem was how, it, how living things deal with the problem of the second law, um, how they deal with it. Now, one of the things that happened is, of course, his, his aperiodic crystal story influenced Crick, influenced the discovery of DNA, and provided us with a kind of information theoretic way of thinking about life. Um, his other question was mostly ignored. Uh, a handful of physicists and so on took it on, and biophysicists. What I take as the message of that book is that these two problems are intimately related to each other. That to think about the nature of information, we have to think about what kind of a process can undermine the dynamics of the second law locally. Not obviously not globally, but locally. Um, the way that other things don't do. Um, now, subsequently, there's lots of been talk about what we call sort of self-organizing processes and so on that can happen in nature. Um, I have gone on record saying I don't think that's enough of a story to tell, the, to tell how this works. Um, the, the piece that excites me about this is that when we talk about organization, when we talk about uh, information, and when we talk about um, thermodynamics, the common train in all of this is this concept of constraint. Um, constraint, as I began at the beginning of this, is something, not the laws, but they're the conditions in which the laws apply. And when a process changes its context, and living processes do this all the time, it changes the parameters in which things occur. And ultimately, those are the constraints. Living processes are continually changing the constraints in which they occur, which then changes the dynamics, which then changes the constraints, which changes the dynamics. A very interesting dynamic that other things don't engage in very often. I mean, once in a while we see something like this happening inorganically. Um, so this idea became really attractive to me. And I want to just sort of lay out a way of thinking about the problem in which the origins of life problem. I've actually come up with a sort of a, a toy model for this that we could talk about. But I, I think we don't have to go there yet. Um, and that is that I think one of the things that happened that's unlike self-organization. And let me just do entropy talk here for a minute. Um, a self-organized process, whether it's a special convection system like a Bernard, Raleigh Bernard convection, maybe you, many of you know about this, it's the uh, convection that produces nice, neat hexagonal convection cells in heated fluids like, like, like oils, for example, um, or something like a snow crystal. Uh, one of the things that's happening in this process is that because it's a dissipative process that is giving up, passing energy through it, um, it generates, interestingly enough, it generates new entropy. Uh, and it does so because, sort of like a refrigeration system, you're using work to push something against the second law. And as a result, we call this maximum entropy production. This comes from uh, uh, Ilya Prigozhin. This idea that, in a sense, to make order, you have to pump up disorder somehow to do that. That's part of the answer to, to Schrodinger's first question. The interesting thing is that Although self-organization, which is entropy maximizing in a sense, ent entropy producing, um, can't be the way life works. Life has to actually stop that process and capture it. It has to generate regularity. That is, it has to produce something that is structure and constraint, but it can't let it dissipate. It has to 
maintain it, preserve it, and pass it um, over time. Uh, the way, the only thing that's, that's common, you know, in a lineage of organisms is not the stuff, but it's the constraints. The organization has been limited in certain ways, and that's what's been passed on. And that's what we call the information that gets passed on. Now, for me, the real interesting question is, how are these two linked together? And uh, uh, the toy model I've talked about is one in which um, self-organizing processes which generate entropy, generate new entropy, so to speak, because they have to do this special work, um, can create, because of the form that they create, the constraints that are generated internally, the regularization that occurs internally, can create constraints on other self-organizing processes. The maximum entropy principle, as I've just described, which is the general way we talk about thermodynamics these days, um, is always defined within constraints. But if you have systems that generate new and novel constraints that are interactive, interdependent on each other, each can change the boundary conditions for the other. And so the, the, the simple model that I have is a kind of molecular model that does exactly this, in which two processes cre each constrain the other, create constraints that bound their dynamics. But as a result, they remember the constraints, and they can pass those constraints on in a way that other systems don't. Now, what I'm after here is that what we mean by information, I think, is tied up in this concept, tied up in the concept of replicating constraints. Constraints are always replicated by a process of work. Uh, that means you have to, in a sense, pour energy through something. Uh, you have to generate, in effect, increased entropy to do it. But in living systems, you have to capture it and pass it on forward. Can you uh, just give us an example of a constraint? OK. The, so one of the things that I'm interested in, uh, and I'll, I'll, let me just describe very quickly the, the simple version of this model. Because what I've done is to take this model and then amplify it in a couple of ways. It's simple enough so that I think in just a description you can get it. Um, there's a process that's called autocatalysis or, auto, or, or what you sometimes call collective catalysis in which a catalyst um, interacts with a substrate to produce a second catalyst which interacts with a substrate to produce the first. So if you have a lot of substrate in your solution and you drop one of these in, eventually um, lots of these catalysts will be produced. They, they accelerate, they snowball forward, produce a huge amount of What happens is that this means in a local area, you get a tremendous asymmetry of concentration of catalysts. Um, the second problem, and that generates um, an asymmetry, which is a constraint, which will eventually, by the second law of thermodynamics, dissipate. Uh, another process, again, that's common in biology, both of these are very common in biological systems, is what we call self-assembly. It's basically what crystals do. That is, by virtue of the regularity of the geometry and the charged surfaces of molecules, uh, they form together in regular lattices, in regular s containers of various kinds. So almost all viruses are contained in a shell. Um, but a shell does something interesting. It keeps diffusion from happening. The problem for building a structure like this is that it uses the same molecules. You've got to have a lot of the same kind of molecules in one place. Its boundary conditions are high concentration of one kind of molecule that has a particular geometry. But the boundary conditions for autocatalysis is the catalysts have to be close together. But normally, a second law would cause, cause them to diffuse away. Um, but these two processes have produced form, that has produced constraints, that are the boundary conditions for the other to happen. What that means is that where autocatalysis occurs, if the catalysts produce as a side product a container molecule, the containers will tend to grab, close in around the catalysts, keep them in place. If that system is broken open again, it will reinitiate reinitiate the process that will again close it. Very, very simple kind of process. But what this means is if you break it open um, too much, you'll get two of them. Break it open, break those open, you get three of them, four of them, so on. It has a kind of replicative capacity without any kind of simple template kind of replication. Now, what I want to get at here is both of these are self-organizing processes. Both of these are processes that generate constraints. Both of them would pump up uh, entropy extrinsically, but they also, when they close up, capture constraints. Like something that freezes, they don't allow the constraints to dissipate. As a result, it can reproduce 
precisely because it replicates those constraints. Now, that requires a physical basis. But what I want to say is that as you begin to think about this, there are now environmental features that will be good for this process or bad for this process. There is the structure of this relationship is one in which there, if there's not correspondence with its environment, uh, it won't occur. Uh, there's a kind of benefit you can see to this or, or cost. In other words, when we talk about adaptation, adaptation is one in which um, there's something that's good for the organism, bad for the organism. The, organi the structure of this has to sort of fit its world. Um, so what I'm after is to actually talk about, and I, I, I can fill this out further, because I think there's a way we can use this to talk about representational issues, uh, because representation has to do with information, has to do with constraint. The, tra the transmission and replication of constraint. And I also think that, that the possibility of evolution is also contingent on this transmission of constraint. So Richard's idea about replication, this is a replication system that does not have a kind of memory molecule, a template molecule. The template is holistically there, but it accomplishes the same thing. What I'm getting at is that I want to shift attention away from what's present, away from the stuff, to the the dynamics that's eliminated in this process. So my interest in emergence is not about the quantum issues. My interest in emergence is, is the origins of life a kind of phase transition in which new kinds of things happen? Things that are what we would call functional, things that are normative, that is, they're good for and bad for issues, uh, and things that are, in effect, intentional, representational. That is, features of this that capture features of the world and allow this to persist in that world. I think rather than talking about consciousness and high level stuff, um, this allows us a much more physically tractable and I think physically even testable way to go at this question about what we mean by information, what we mean by representation. What we mean by end directedness. This is a system that, in effect, has very trivial kind of end directedness as well. It will tend in some directions, not in, other, not in others. It's an asymmetry of tendency that's based upon the second law of thermodynamics, but in fact uses the second law against itself, so to speak. And so my issue here is to shift the discussion of emergence away from really abstract stuff and talk about the kind of emergence that I think matters to you and I. And that's the kind of emergence that has to do with meaning, reference, and value. Uh, and uh, I think that we can start that process not way at the top, not way at human beings and stuff, and consciousness, or even brains, though I'm interested in those. I think we can start this at the bottom and ask the question, if it is in principle possible for me to say that I've crossed this threshold, that is, whether you're going to phase change or whatever, from inanimate matter to animate matter, which has these features, then if it's in principle to do it there, then it's going to be in principle to do this story at higher and higher levels. And so that's my, my sort of claim for the emergent story. It's not an emergent story that's top down or bottom up. Um, it's completely compatible with reductionism. Uh, but it's actually looking at a different level. And the way I would put it is if I was to respond to Descartes today, I would say that you know, the, the thought stuff, whatever that was in this other world, uh, in the abstract world that Descartes has separate from the body, is in fact just what's not there. It's just the absence. It's just what's constrained out. I think it's presence and absence, not the physical world and the metaphysical world or the, uh, the spiritual world. I think that we've confused uh, what's not there, what's constrained, um, with this sort of metaphysical world. Uh, but I think the constraints are where we need to look uh, for that second piece. Um, so I'm going to stop at that because I've, I've laid out a lot of, a lot of stuff. Um, you and I have been apparently converging on a number of paths. And, um, to re tie what you just said to a theme that I also raised this morning. Um, one of the things we learned from Darwin is don't look for essences. And as somebody recently said, and you don't want to be an essentialist about Darwinism either. <laughs> you want to recognize that there are hemi-semi-demi proto-Darwinian processes and the prebiotic processes that you want to describe that eventually lead to 
replication and genuinely fully act Darwinian replication and evolution. They are remarkably like natural selection in a number of ways. And you've, you've given your version of that. I've got, this, uh, I think, a compatible version which looks at the same thing and points out that all the cycles at every scale in nature, from the cycles of the, of the seasons and the cycles of day and night, and then all of these micro cycles within chemistry, all of these repetitive cycles, they're do loops. They're, they're algorithmic do loops, and they get put together in a tremendous asynchronous way. And some of them are, in some sense, cumulative. That is, if you keep doing it long enough, eventually something changes. Mm -hmm. you, you increase a concentration of something, you create an asymmetry, and then that changes everything and you're off again. I think if you think about abiotic period, the abiotic period, in that way, as sort of proto-Darwinian, having these various chemical processes in the end and, and higher, larger scale processes, which eventually, they keep changing, I'll use your word, changing the constraints until finally you get the sort of thing where life can, life in the, with replicative machinery and so forth can take off. Now, um, uh, I think that's, so I entirely sort of agree with you there. I think I'll try to say some things about other ways of fleshing that out before, but I want to return to, before people forget to, to this morning for one moment. Um, I, I want to correct this thing I said. I said that Alex's view was, was surprisingly old fashioned as philosophy, and I said it reminded me of Socrates. It did, but there's a better, there's a contemporary of Socrates that I think is actually much better for his view. And that's Parmenides. And I once had, I, I gave up teaching the pre-Socratics when I had a student who wrote on her hour exam, Parmenides is the one who said, there's just one thing and I'm not it. <laughs> and I thought, Damn, she's right. <laughs> That's what, and and Alex is heading to Parmenides. He's got he's got two things. He's got he's got fermions and bosons, but but he's as a Parmenidean as he could be. So, let me just say one thing, just just to just to move to the the core question behind this as I see it, and that is what's going to fit into naturalism and what's not. My view is that physics uh, complexified. Um, not, not particle physics, but the whole picture of the physical world, um, will include, uh, in a way, uh, that makes sense to you and me, even, even at the level of free will issues, um, what it means to have an experience, what it means for meaning to be efficacious in the world. I think it's going to include it. Um, I think that it's bad as a scientist for me to imagine that, oh, I can throw this stuff out without actually knowing how it works. And I don't think we know how it works yet, but I think that one of the, the issues for me is to do everything I can to figure out how it works as I think it is. And only after I've completely failed or been shown to be on the wrong track in some sort of fundamental way would I give that up. So, so excuse me. Yeah, go ahead. So, I myself am not as troubled as you are about the origins of life from a abstract and theoretical point of view, I can see how molecules that replicate by templating or any of a half a dozen other means uh, and um, have varying amounts of stability should have found their way into the kind of systems which produce what we recognize as life and um, uh, eigencycles and other kinds of problems about whether it's an RNA world or an RNA amino acid world are matters of detail to be left to the followers of Mueller and, and, yeah. and um, uh, similar Miller kinds and Uri, of uh, Ure yeah. experiments. Yeah, yeah. I want to know, much more simply than you expressed it just now, how you get from self-replicating molecules that uh, uh, 
or that, that withstand the processes of entropy to representation, meaning, and, uh, in, uh, and normativity. All right, well, so, so first of all, I don't think that molecules that replicate themselves is the story. Um, and this is where I would, uh, I'm against the I want to know where the story thing. is. I don't want to know where the story is. <laughs> no, no, that, that, that's fine. So, but what I want, so I, first of all, I'm not going to tell you where consciousness is in this story. Obviously, I'm oh, I, at a very I don't want level. that either. I, okay, I asked for some so, very okay, minimal right. stuff. So what, I, what I've described is I want to come up with the simplest possible chemical system that doesn't just persist, but actually rebuilds itself if damaged. One of the problems with simple replication stories, and any kind of catalytic network replicates molecules. Um, but in fact, none of those molecules repair themselves. If there's anything that's happened, that's it. Um, the system I just described actually repairs itself when damaged. That is, it, the constraints provide information for rebuilding the system. So it's not reproduction that I'm after here. I'm actually after what you might call self-reconstitution or repair. Uh, I think that's the more fundamental issue. Once you have that feature, that means there are features of the world that are antagonistic to that tendency that's now intrinsic to this system, and features of the world that are consistent with its preservation and its ability to do this. That, for me, is the simplest form of normativity. We would say this about an organism as well. There's their features in the world. Now, that's not normativity in the strong ethical sense, but it is in the sense that there could be features that could be wrong. That is, a system could be constructed in such a way that it simply errors in the way it interacts chemically with things in the world, makes mistakes. The mistakes are now identified by the fact that it will no longer maintain itself. The self will disappear. It won't repair itself. Um, that, for me, is normativity. The second piece of that is this notion of function. Now I can say that each of the components of a system like this um, is there, as Kant would say, for the other. Each is there for the other. In a sense, all the parts make each other in some sort of closed way. Again, that's necessary for this to happen. But that's, that's this notion of function, function which is, in effect, we would say, indirected. It's not, for me, in this sense, epiphenomenal to say that this is functional. This is really functional because there's something like self. That self is, is embodied in the constraints, not in the stuff, but in the constraints that get passed on. I just, I think there's, so if we're going to have a discussion of emergence, this business about the origins of things that, 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 that processes that don't reduce in some sense or might, or might not reduce in the classical way is one key thread. Another key thread, though, I think, um, is, is distinguishing between two different notions of what it means for one process to be fundamental relative to another. And I think we'll have great difficulty being clear about emergence if we don't make the distinction. I agree. So one, right, one sense of fundamental that's often used is things out of which everything else is composed. Mm -hmm. right. Another sense of fundamental, though, which can be independent of, of levels in that traditional sense, another sense of fundamental is one respect, a respect in which, say, quantum field theory is fundamental, is that, in principle, every observation of everything in the universe is an implicit test of it. Right? Quantum theory constrains everything at all scales everywhere. Mm -hmm. Whereas most of the things that are studied in the sciences aren't like that. Right. Could I add maybe a little additional clarification? I think it's very important to distinguish between uh, this kind of reductionism as a research program that you're not happy unless you re-express, say, thermodynamics in terms of quantum field theory, which nobody defends. That's a straw man. Mm -hmm. uh, or whether you're talking not about our research, but what actually exists out there in the sense of entailment. Um, are the laws of thermodynamics entailed by other laws like elementary particle physics? And if so, one can talk about more fundamental levels or not. The fundamental levels are the levels from which the arrows of entailment go up 
and um, it, it gives a sense of order in nature, which exists in nature, is not necessarily something that we yet understand or that we can actually use. Uh, there's no question that thermodynamics um, is worth studying in its own terms. Uh, and in fact, as has often been pointed out, if you could follow the motion of every particle in a glass of water, um, you would still miss the idea of what the temperature of the water is. The things we're interested in are often at a higher level. But the question is whether or not principles, like the principles of thermodynamics, are what they are because of deeper principles. And, and if that kind of statement makes sense, as I think it does, then um, we have a sense of what is fundamental and what is not fundamental. It, it, it's a question of following the arrows of what explains what, not in the sense that we explain it, but that na that's how nature works. But I have two questions there. I'm sorry. Um, the first yeah. one is you're using the word entailing, which is interesting uh, because, you know, do you mean entailing in the sense of uh, the higher level description of phenomena are compatible with? No, I mean part, tail, you, but, you actually mean completely yeah. described by. Right. Right, I think that is, you're right, that is the question. The, the question I have is what justifies the belief that the lower levels do entail completely everything above them? Well, of course, we don't know. No, that's what we're trying to figure right. out. But it, that's the way history has worked. Uh, I think there is a reason why people are skeptical about this, and it's the sort of thing Anderson wrote about in that article, More is Different, mm -hmm. and is always quoted, uh, and that is that and I think you have written about it in the um, article of yours I read on the plane here, and that is that a lot of the features of these higher level theories don't seem to depend very much on what's going on at the deeper level. For example, in phase transitions, which you wrote about, uh, there are certain numbers which describe how systems approach phase transitions, these are so-called critical exponents, mm -hmm. And you get the same critical exponents in a tremendous variety of entirely different contexts. And it makes you think that there are laws of phase transitions which are somehow freestanding and are not, do not require any deeper level to be entailed. They just are the way they are. I don't think that's right. I think you have bodies of formalism, like the renormalization group theory of phase transitions, or thermodynamics, which apply in a great variety of circumstances, but when they apply, they apply because of a deeper level that says they apply here, and they don't always apply. I mean, for example, Boltzmann made a tremendous step forward when he showed that the uh, atomic theory, that molecules are bopping around explains uh, or entails the laws of thermodynamics. And then it was realized that those laws apply in entirely different contexts, like as Hawking showed, the surface of a black hole has a certain temperature. Um, but in, in all cases where thermodynamics applies, we can show why it applies in terms of a deeper level. And it doesn't always apply. Uh, a black hole only obeys the laws of thermodynamics when it's big, when it contains many Planck masses. And in the last instant before a black hole evaporates, the laws of thermodynamics no longer apply to it. Um, Is there any one example where you don't have something like that? I, no, I, I think, well, for example... Well, you have a temperature, but it's not caused by causal <laughs> Hey, well, no such thing. well, no, I think temperature always is, uh, exists because you have a large system. Right. I mean, that's where temperature comes from. Uh, to take an even more trivial example, uh, the sum of the angles of a triangle is 180 degrees, and it doesn't matter whether you make the triangle with pencil marks on a piece of paper or with sticks. I mean, all of those are physical instances where you get 180 degrees. Um, you have to ask, well, why does that work in each case? The answer generally speaking, is because the 
gravitational field on the surface of the Earth is quite weak, so it doesn't curve space very much. Um, I mean, that's the, that's the reductionist answer to why the sum of the angles is 180 degrees. But now there's a lot of work being done by the word because. In your well, but I, uh -huh. yeah, I, I mean, I have in mind something I can't prove is true. I claim that the whole development of physics has been in this direction, which doesn't really prove anything. And that is that there really are, induction. in nature, really. entailments. Uh, I mean, when you know the paradigm is Newton shows that the inverse square law entails Kepler's laws of planetary motion. Um, Boltzmann shows that the statistical mechanics of large numbers of molecules entails the laws of thermodynamics. This is our bread and butter. Look, this comes up in a very <coughs> practical way when we particle physicists want to build accelerators. Um, and this was a big, you know, Anderson testified in the Senate that we shouldn't build the super collider because uh, there's no sense in which elementary particles physics is more fundamental than his work in condensed matter physics. And uh, we had to make the case, and failed to make it, that, uh, that it is more fundamental. It doesn't mean that condensed matter physics isn't interesting. Um, and it doesn't mean that the condensed matter physicists should only think about quarks and gluons. But it does mean that there's a certain quality of fundamentalness which is, has some value in its own right. Uh, we lost that argument. Thank goodness the Europeans went ahead and built an accelerator. Uh, so it's a very practical matter. I, uh, I got dragged into thinking about philosophy by this issue at the time we were trying to get the super collider uh, finished and wrote a book because of it. Uh, it is the goal that we have in physics. It's the goal that's historically been working out over the centuries. And to, uh, as you did in the Massimo, in the paper I read, um, uh, to deny the existence of more fundamental levels and less fundamental levels really um, makes a lot of the history of, of physics pointless. Again, just with respect to what we mean by fundamental. So, so you spoke of entailment. I, I think mu I think one could it seems to me one could capture most of what you said, if not all of it, by referring to constraints instead. Right. So, so quantum physics constrains absolutely everything. Thermodynamics doesn't. No, no, right? no, I'm talking about principles. That is, if you discover a principle uh, like the principles of thermodynamics or the principle that sex ratios tend to be equal, male, female, yeah. you then ask why is that principle true? You might say it's a fundamental law of life that or organisms that have sexual reproduction tend to have equal numbers of males and females. But in fact, we don't, we're not happy with that. We try to explain it in terms of a deeper level, which is evolutionary biology, and uh, which is in turn, you know, why, do, uh, why does evolution work? Will we explain that in terms of mutations and uh, uh, natural selection? Very often we can't do the whole job because historical accidents intervene, which we, by definition we can't explain. But I'm not saying simply that quantum field theory constrains everything. I'm saying that wherever you find a principle at any level, uh, a, a statement uh, about, I mean, for example, if in the kind of chemical or biological phenomena you are talking about, whatever constraint you have, certain things are always true, mm -hmm. or for certain kinds of constraints, certain other things are always true. Then you, it's a general principle, you have to explain it. The explanation will always be in terms of something more fundamental. I, I try to use the word entail rather than explain because explain we can't really do. <laughs> that's, that, <laughs> no, that's always. I think that's, that's raising, all that, that's confusing actually. I mean, I, mean, I think that there's a formal sense of entailment which you could probably develop. You well, know, the sense in which uh, no, the but, arrows point forwards. But, but I'm trying to I get away what explanation. I'm trying to get away from that positivistic point of view that. If you don't have, a, if you don't really realize it, then you're talking about metaphysics. I think there really is out there uh, a, a um, 
a set of fundamental laws. And anywhere else you find principles, they are what they are because of those fundamental laws. So, so my, my point was really just to identify, fund, to propose that it's less misleading and invites fewer, less trouble in other respects to associate fundamentality with universal. With, with, with what is fundamental with what is universal rather than, uh, rather than with notions of composition. Yeah. Um, so well, in, in it, fact, what, I'm, what I am trying to get to here is another way to think about the emergence problem. Because a working automobile or a failed automobile uses the same fundamental laws of physics. Um, there is something different about them. The conditions in which those laws are expressed are different. There are different boundary conditions in which they're expressed. My interest in presenting it this way is to say, look, there is no incompatibility here, uh, but we've been looking in the wrong place. We've been looking at universals, universal laws, and not looking at particular boundary conditions. My claim about life is it's in the process of changing its own boundary conditions constantly. And that's what changes things. The fundamental laws never change in this process. But new kinds of causality, in the sense of new kinds of work being done in the galaxy, show up because of this. We have typewriters and computers because of this. They're not because of the, the fundamental laws have changed, but because boundary conditions are continually changing which fundamental laws get expressed in which ways. That's a different way of doing the emergence story. I'm worried that the emergence story of trying to say that it has to do with new laws, quote, in some kind of universal sense, is leading us astray. And that it's going to make it hard for us to explain things like representation, things like value, and so on. I, mean, I think we need to shift our, our focus. What's the goal of, of reframing it this way? It's not to say that there's some disconnect between some underlying microphysics or something like this. It's rather to say that it's more powerful as a mode of explanation and moving forward. I mean, in some sense, you know. So what I want to say is that, that I don't think we have enough tools if we throw out the constraint story at every level. To do what? To, to, explain, uh, to explain why I'm talking to you now and why you're responding the way right. you are. But to explain. Oh. You don't have enough tools to explain if you only look at causal microphysics. But I, I, yeah, if yeah, I take yeah. Steve's point correctly, then that's the idea. It would be foolish for a fundamental <laughs> physicist to say, I'm going to explain the origin of life and your consciousness by looking at quantum field theory, and here I go. You know, that would be an absolute absurd task. On so nobody's hand, saying it's yeah, a great form point, of yeah. explanation of yeah. phenomena. On the other hand, if there was some general principle <laughs> that uh, governed all life, uh, I would try to explain it in terms of microphysics. So I, I like, I, I'm on board with your program of uh, you know, adopting a foundational, uh, there's a fact of the matter at, at the bottom. And I also like the notion that it entails generalizations that we want to make and that's these in, that there are arrows that we respect. But I, I guess I can't see how you, why does that commit us to using those foundational principles to explain, maybe I have a different notion of explanation, things at a different level. That we said the opposite. Our job is finding the, regularities the in the world. And we don't have to, well, even though that's entailed, we don't have to appeal to that I mean, for most, the explanation. Most of what we experience depends on historical accidents that cannot be explained. Um, and uh, it's just where... Here and there, you can find things that uh, can be explained in a robust way that doesn't depend on the accident that you know we grew up and uh, we happen to want to build a car rather than not build a car. Um, the uh, and those are the things where, <clears throat> where I think the whole point is, uh, and I'm ha you know if, if we agree on this, I'm happy that there are no freestanding principles at any level which uh, do not have an ultimate explanation in terms of deeper principles. I don't think that uh, deep any, it's not even interesting to try to explain uh, the variety of life on earth uh, in terms of the deepest principles, but if you could say something very general about life in general, uh, maybe life on all planets. Uh, well, you know, for example, no one will ever explain why the Earth is 93 million miles from the sun, which affects everything else we've been talking about. But we can explain statistically, we haven't yet, why planets are at various distances from their stars. And, um, and in that way you might get a, an explanation of the statistical properties of life seen through the universe. 
that's the kind of thing where you could think of a reduction to uh, microvis. But if you're not talking about principles, you're just talking about facts, like there's a car that doesn't work, then not, you know, that's not my bit, that's above my pay grade. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask a question. <laughs> We've raised a little bit in the last two minutes and, and to see if I understand correctly, and then ask a question of uh, follow up. So we agree. I think it's pretty uncontroversial that, as a matter of fact, epistemically, there's no such a thing as a reasonable project of reducing, say, biology or ecology or, or economics to fix. I don't they, agree. Well, okay. <laughs> Bracketing you for a minute, just. just I, and I'll so give you some most, great examples of where part of that has been done and had fantastic okay. theoretical and practical payoff. Then I, then I want to hear that story, um, but although I might need some drink before that. <laughs> but, but I think most of us at least agree um, that that is not possible, uh, but it's less interesting because, okay, that could simply be a matter of epistemic you know, complexity and you know, we can't get there, fine. So we agree that the fundamental question is, in fact, if in principle um, all we need to do is to have the fundamental laws of physics. But then the best argument I've heard, and I think it is, I think it is the best argument I've ever heard, actually, in favor of that, is a simple historical induction from the history of a particular subset of physics. Now, without having to invoke Hume's problem of induction, I don't want to go there, um, it seems to me that that is a fairly weak argument because, first of all, there are plenty of other instances, even within physics, where that kind of reductive program hasn't worked very well. Um, and, and second of all, it's written with, well, like we were saying earlier, you know, phase transitions, you cannot I describe. Phase transition works wonderfully. I mean, um, I think that's the great well, achievement. Of you're the physicist, but I understand the, from the readings, from my readings, that in fact it only works as an approximation. And you have to invoke things that are not directly derived from, from the bottom level analysis. I, I'm perfectly happy to be stand corrected on that. But if that is true, it has no, worked even partially. Phase transition is always an approximation, right. which is valid, and the limit is the size of the system right. becomes infinitely large. Correct, but it, there are things, you know, there, as we've seen, there are, there are alternative ways to conceptualize that as, you know, it's an approximation because in fact there are these, these other ways of doing, of, of describing the phenomenon that, that invoke things that do not, they're not derivable from the lowest levels. At any rate, at any other higher level than that, so far this hasn't happened. So I wonder then two things. Let's assume that that is the best argument one, one has. And as all, all historically inductive arguments, it's a, you know, at the very least, it's not compelling. It's it maybe the best argument there is, but it's not compelling. compelling is anything. Well, I mean, maybe. It's, it's, it's an emergence of the gaps program here. Maybe. <laughs> no, 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 wait a minute. Wait a minute. The, yes, maybe. But then I'm wondering, what is at stake exactly here? Right? Because if the, if the empirical stuff tells us, no, reduction isn't going to work all the way down, and even theoretically, we run into serious trouble with at least you know, smart people, as just as smart as anybody else in this room, thinking that you know, this, this is not a slam dunk at all. And what exactly hinges on this thing, other than the uh, amor proprio, would say, would be the Italian word of, of uh, fundamental <laughs> physicists? Um, you know, who cares? Theists so, care. I mean, this whole thing is... But who cares about theists, really? <laughs> we certainly... I know, Jerry, but these, these we certainly don't. This is a, a watchword for, for religious people. It, yeah. Well, we then... too much about that. Yeah, well, exactly. Well, I don't, in, fact, in fact, I think we shouldn't worry about it. We have to know what's the case. It wouldn't, it, we have to know what's the case. I think we shouldn't worry about it at all, which is, was, goes back to what Dan was saying this morning about, you know, design, you use the word design. I mean, yes, I agree that there is... There will always be people that use philosophical or scientific uh, concepts in, in the misuse them to, pu to push their own agendas. So what? They're wrong and they're probably willfully wrong. Uh, okay, but we're discussing, I thought, not what is the best way to present things to the external public, but what is the best understanding we can come up with, right? I'll well, stop there I'm happy with the word emergence um, because, I, because they emerge. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> What do the emergence mean? I mean, right. phase transitions emerge from the forces that act between particles. Uh, it's true that there are features of phase transitions which don't depend on the details of those forces. It's also true that there are facts about triangles that don't depend on the details of how the triangles are made. But you, if in order to answer the question whether or not those features apply to any particular 
physical system, you have to understand how those features of phase transitions emerge, I'll use the word, in the particular microscopic system you're talking about. And you know, not all systems have the same critical exponents. Um, the whole theory doesn't always work. Uh, it works when there is a logical necessity for it to work based on more fundamental principles. Um, I don't know of any case where we have generalizations, uh, at least within physics, I don't know that much about biology, but within physics I don't know any case where we have general principles that we can't see emerging from a lower level and we can identify the fundamental level from which they, f f which, from which they are entailed. Uh, I don't, I mean that's, I disagree very strongly with what you said about phase transitions. Can, can, I, can I just say, I, one of the interests here is now there's a, there's a sort of a physical story about emergence that we could struggle with. Um, but it seems to me that the reason that we're interested in the topic is, is and this is different people, maybe, but it's, it's partly because there's this naturalism, non-naturalism distinction. The question is, what's going to fit in our naturalism story? Are we going to eliminate in some strong sense, uh, and, and th that's what this morning was struggling with, what are we going to eliminate and what are our principles for eliminating them? Um, uh, my sense is that uh, we don't want to be too hasty at what we eliminate. And, that's, uh, and if that's going to allow the religious fundamentalists to say, aha, these, these guys don't really have it all together yet, uh, that's fine with me because I want to know what's the case, not, not about what they will take and run with. Uh, as an evolutionary biologist, I have been through my whole career battling against these people. I get letters probably every two or three days from somebody that you know, tells me I'm about to go to hell or whatever because of my beliefs and because I'm messing up all these young minds and sending them to the devil. Um, I don't worry about that because I want to know how it works. Uh, and uh, if they take what I'm doing as sort of helping them along their game, I'm not too worried so long as I figure out what I'm talking about. So I, I want to be, this is I think the political side of this question that Dan was sort of hinting at. Yeah, we'll um, certainly uh, come around to Dan's Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I think <laughs> what we want to know is what is the case. Well, but I mean, so look, most of the things that Steve's argument is not a knockdown argument, even though the history of physics shows only a one-way progression that things get entailed but the lower levels, but the, lower, the higher levels don't entail the lower levels. Okay. But, but again, this no, is a bottom-up, top-down game. Yeah. Now, wait, is that I'm the not only finished story? yet. Is there a case in which you can show that a higher level emergence property cannot be consonant with something at a lower level? Well, I, I don't believe that there is such a thing. I mean, I mean, I could make up things like uh, if there was an innate tendency of life to improve, as, as used to be thought before Darwin, uh, people believed in evolution, but they thought it was because life, it's a law of life that life tries to improve. And um, if that were true, I would say, well, uh, you know, that just means that there's separate biological laws. They are not, they are not entailed by physical laws. We live in a world governed by different bodies of law, and we just have to live with it. But I mean, it was a great breakthrough to realize that that's not true, that in fact, uh, although you don't put it in terms of elementary particles, the kind of thing that allows life to get better is the kind of thing that can be entailed by the deeper level of elementary particles. So what would be wrong with, with my intuition that if, that, if, if we took a pre-Darwinian view of life having an inherent tendency to improve, I would be deeply unsatisfied with any suggestion that this is just a fundamental property of life. I would want to explain why, where that comes from. Uh, and well, I you can't see you, but I don't think people at that time did. Uh, well, but I would also say it's just the fact you may or may not be able to succeed. You would certainly want to try. I'm sympathetic. You want to try. Right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, actually, they did know where it came from. They, it came from God. But uh, I mean, even the. But was there anyone? I mean, you know much more about the history than I do. Was there anyone in that pre-Darwinian age who believed in evolution and believed in an inherent tendency to improve and who 
didn't just state it as a fact, but tried to explain it in terms of something else? Oh, the, the mark, I suppose. Yeah. Well, but no, the also, mark took that as, a, century, as an axiom, right. that there's an inherent tendency. He, yes, but he, he also had the law of use and disuse. He also had the idea oh, that, the, I see what you that mean. the more the animal used its, okay. its muscles, it, the bigger they grew, grew. Yeah, well, that might have been true, yeah. and you could imagine it being true, and you can imagine it being based on a... Yeah, that's a good point. Sure, you can imagine, you can imagine it being based on a fundamental particle physics level. Yeah. Uh, it just isn't the case. It still wouldn't work, even if it was the case. I mean, it's, it, if, 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 if on Mars in, um, acquired characteristics were inherited, it still wouldn't be a viable evolutionary theory. But at the time, they thought it, it could. You mean it wouldn't fit the facts of evolution? No, or it wouldn't, it wouldn't lead it to wouldn't, evolution? It wouldn't be powerful enough to produce ah, adaptations like I see. Okay. So in fact, it would be replaced by natural selection. <laughs> The, the That's fairly a, simple point I've been trying to make is that I, I think Terry's denial of top that the, the sort of top down bottom up picture is should be the basis of all attempts to account for emergence is perfectly compatible mm -hmm. with the view that parts of physics are are fundamental right so it seems just true of the sociology and history of science that if a special science most special sciences are if they're related at all to each other, we're not quite sure how they're related to each other. But whenever a conflict, and so a conflict can emerge between special sciences, and there's no the empirical work will have to sort it out. But when a special science contradicts fundamental physics, it's the special science that has to shit that, that has to be changed, right? And there is and, a signal. But case. there's no reason you don't have to. Darwin explain was that. very worried about Kelvin's that uh, primacy claim of, about the age of the sun and the amount of energy it can yeah. put out. Yeah, yeah, but I'll that primacy it. of physics claim, that, that fact that physics trumps, fundamental physics trumps, uh, that's perfectly compatible with the idea that you, it doesn't require us to suppose that uh, it's because physics describes a bedrock level, right, and then there are other levels stacked on top of it. Um, physics, it's in fundamental physics just is, it seems to me, the study of those universal constraints. Uh, that apply everywhere. It might help if we had a simple toy model of what we're saying doesn't happen. <laughs> um, uh, and it occurs to me a nice example might be think about the rules of chess. And think about somebody who tries to derive the rules of chess from the physics of chess pieces moving around. <laughs> and think, now, you know, queen goes on her own color. Jesus, now, you know. And they're trying to figure out what affinities there are and trying to devise that from physics or, or the, the, you know, the castling rule. And they finally throw up their hands and say, these are deep regularities, but they're at their own level. They don't reduce, to, they just don't reduce to physics. Now, you can imagine somebody having a view about biology or any of the, or, or sociology, which is the view that, as it turns out, there are the rules of the game in these higher sciences that just bloody are, and, and maybe there's a historical explanation of how they came to be the rules, but even those aren't really going to be explicable in terms of, of the underlying physics. That at least gives us a model of what I think none of us accept. We all think that whatever good sense of emergence there is, there's no, there's nothing that is a, a principle like that. It's always going to emerge from from physics. Yeah, I think I can actually simultaneously disagree with Massimo and Steve a little bit, uh, <laughs> in the sense that uh, I it's think we can do better. Yes, that <laughs> well, might be outside both of you and inside, but I think we can do better than Leon history to argue um, for the what we're referring to as the microscopic or more fundamental level being. Uh, more comprehensive than the macroscopic level. But I think that meant, you know, maybe part of the contentiousness comes in in using words like explain or because when we're talking about the relationships between these different levels. I think that it's, on the one hand, plausible and apparently true that you can have these macroscopic regularities that could have been exactly the same and equally true with very different microscopic underlying substrates. And therefore, in some sense, maybe exactly that sense, deserve to be thought of as independent rules. But it's also true that there is this more comprehensive theory that has a wider domain of applicability with the feature that in the region of that microscopic theory that overlaps with the macroscopic theory, the microscopic theory entails the macroscopic theory. You can have thermodynamics and many other substrates, but once you know what the substrate is, you're, we're gonna have thermodynamics. You're not gonna have anything else. 
And I think that we can stop there. I don't think it's necessary. I mean, I, I have many times in the past, and I understand the desire to say, now we have explained the macroscopic regularities, but what if we didn't say that? What would change? I mean, both levels exist and are interesting to talk about. And it's, if we're sticking to understanding what happens in the world, I think we can just say that and then use for our sort of personal motivational purposes whether or not that counts as an explanation or a justification or more fundamental or whatever. Well, when you say once we have the, the, this level, the microscopic level, we have thermodynamics, I, uh, that's just another way of rephrasing that thermodynamics is entailed by the... I like the word entailed, but then when... It, so saying that is fine, I wouldn't argue with that, but maybe there's daylight in between saying that and saying the reason why thermodynamics is true is because of the underlying atomic. Well, I don't see, I don't see yeah, I, I don't see any daylight. <laughs> <laughs> what's, the da what's the daylight? Might be, you might have evidence for its truth independent of its grounding in more fundamental uh, physical processes, yeah. but the evidence is not the grounds of its truth, it's the reason to believe it. Well, Epist epistemology is different from metaphysics. Sure, but let me ask you another question. Yes, it, it is different from metaphysics, although I, I agree with, I think, Don and his, and his colleague, James Lediman, sentiment that, if, that, that metaphysics better be in, highly informed from your epistemology, otherwise you're just going to say things that you have no reason to say. Now, not that I'm accusing you of doing that, but, but if there is, in fact, a link between epistemology and metaphysics, then again, it, the fact that we actually, in many different cases, fail to pro provide for an epistemologically grounded uh, reduction, extreme reduction, goody reductionism, then it ought to be at least to worry us uh, to some extent. It's not proof that it wouldn't work, but it should be a worry. Now, Shane, let me ask you, however, a question, which is, let's say that, we, that I bite the bullet and I say, fine, okay, then the fundamental laws of physics are, are entail everything else in a strong sense of entailment. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not just compatible. I, we all agree, I think, that they are compatible, right? right? But uh, with uh, with higher level phenomena, but they actually entail. Now, what do you think then then would happen or will happen when you go basically in the other direction, which is yes, but the fundamental laws of physics themselves presumably come from somewhere, or is there a bottom line where we're going to stop? When well, we're going to say, so, sorry, let me finish this yeah. part just for a second. This is really a curiosity. I'm not trying to sort of tribute anything to anything. I'm just saying. So, if if it's acceptable to say that there is a foundational level, right, and everything else is just derivable, at least in principle, from that level, then the obvious question becomes, well, why is that level fund foundational, and how do you account for that one? Now, if you, if you are like Richard, and you, and you say, well, no, I want to ask the question of where does that come from, you risk going into an infinite regress. Uh, if you do re have that risk, then what is the problem with saying, oh, as it turns out, that one wasn't really foundational, um, so maybe there is something about that that it's also compatible with, but yeah, I need to be... But you can still be say that there... there I mean, you can say it's your near, that your turtles are lower down than the higher ones, right? <laughs> right. I mean, it yeah, well, so if it's turtles all the way down, the, the, you, you may, we may disagree uh, where the, the topmost turtle is, but it's perfectly conceivable that there is another one above the one that you recognize as a turtle. So I'm asking, is it, is it all the way... Turtle, turtles all the way down in your opinion? Right, or so I mean, I'm not the one to ask that because the answer is I don't care. So uh, that's <laughs> That's why exactly I was saying that okay. it doesn't matter to me to whether or not, I mean, so it does matter to me that once you have atomic physics, you can, you will always get thermodynamics. I think that makes sense. And I think that, you know, that's the difference between that example and the chess example. Once you have atomic physics, you will not always have chess. That mm -hmm. is a truly separate thing. Mm -hmm. The world seems to operate in a way that we have theories, models, vocabularies, whatever you want to call them, that are nested, that have strictly contained other uh, theories, and I think that atomic physics strictly contains thermodynamics in that way. But I think that, and I, I go around saying that our current version of the everyday laws of physics, the laws of physics underlying tables and chairs and people, the standard model plus gravity, uh, is never going to change. There might be levels under it. Mm -hmm. And a thousand years from now, we will still say that the table is made of atoms and, and electrons, and, and we can still describe the gravitational field as the curvature of space-time. We might have a better, more comprehensive underlying uh, understanding of it, but we will not abandon the atoms and gravity explanation, just exactly as we have not abandoned thermodynamics and talk about temperature. 
And so it doesn't, it doesn't, the existence of possible underlying levels is not required. I mean, it would be great. That's what I do for a living. Look for it. Uh, we would like to have it. Uh, but that's why I was saying you know, to Richard, yes, we should look for it, but we, we can't a priori demand that there be something that qualifies as an explanation under these terms. There will be a bottom or not. Right. Right. This would help me. Uh, you know, Dan had the idea of making believe there are four undergraduates in the room, and I liked his example too of the the chess and the um, particles. So I'm just trying to understand. That. Let me put a simple question out there. So uh, th this goes to Sean and to Steve and to um, anybody who's spoken. I think. So suppose right now we have something like let's say at some level of physics we have um, uh, the inverse square law. And right now in, say, psychology, uh, although most psychologists would not say it's the most important thing, there's some agreement that there's something like principles of operant conditioning. So these would, I think, satisfy earlier what Steve was talking about as principles, right? These would be principles. I don't know what they, mean, what they are, what you're referring to. Well, the principle of like operant conditioning would just be Skinnerian conditioning that, uh, oh, that oh, you know, oh. if, you, if you reward people according to different okay. uh, schedules of reinforcement, they're, they'll, they're, 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 it'll increase the probability the of their behavior, or frequency or intensity of their behavior. And um, so then is the picture that, that um, there, the idea would be that the even if those are sui generis right now, they stand alone, then some people seem to hold the idea that ultimately, if science keeps going the way it's been going, or if the world is unified, I don't know the answer to this question, someday or other we'll see the entailment relations that will be from the physical level to the psychological level. Is that the idea? Well, I, don't I think, think we'll ever see them. Or yes. if you think yeah. we'll see That's them. what I thought. Okay, so well, well, let me, well, I don't me, know what. I'm not exactly saying that. So let no, me say I didn't think way. you were saying that, so that's what I was trying to draw out. I agree with I'll the entailment, that. but I think that the derivability is a, is a, is a red herring. Right. Okay. So yeah. I, think I, would, I would agree with the entailment in exactly Alex's sense, which is that. Whether or not I can ever, like I can go through equations and derive thermodynamics yeah. from atomic physics. Yeah. It may or may not ever be possible to go through equations and derive psychology from atomic physics. But if I arrange a bunch of atoms and let the psychology happen, and I do that again somewhere else in the universe, I'm absolutely sure the same psychology will happen. Can I, can I just ask a question about entailment? So if, if I imagine what happens at CERN, um, and this is not what happens at CERN, but it's a, it's a cartoon, people have facts about sort of macroscopic objects, right? Needles and dials and things on the computer screen. And no one ever actually directly touches a quark, right? So in fact, all of their in inferences about atomic physics and, and subatomic physics are entailed by facts about the macroscopic <coughs> world. So the, it, it seems like the intelligence No, goes entailed through. is the wrong word. Well, so supported we by, evidentially supported by facts about the observable world. Well, they're so also we, caused we, by facts about the external world. I mean. We came yeah, to the our theories because prepared. certain okay. physicists saw certain reader readings on meters, mm -hmm. um, but that's not why the laws are what they are. So there's that may be why we we know that what they are. Different so, issue. So there's there's okay. So from atomic physics to psychology, right? This is not derivability, right? Um, it's not what you said. Evidential support, right? Evidential support apparently goes the other way, right? So it, goes I both ways, it, goes both. it goes both ways, okay, but that can't be why physics should get all the money, because if it goes both ways, then we should... <laughs> that is not... So what is this wiggling line? It's that it's impossible, it's logically impossible, for the, sub, the, the underneath level to exist uh -huh. and the upper level not to exist. Anytime you recreate that fundamental level, the other way, it's, it's really entailment in that okay. logical sense. There is no possible world in which you have the fundamental level and not... But isn't that what the CERN people say? There's no possible world in which all the meters read this way and the Higgs boson doesn't exist. So that also seems to be a bidirectional arrow. Mm -hmm. No, but those are very no. different no. senses. No. Yeah. And then I'm, I'm, I'm missing the distinction then. I think Rebecca's point is more logical, not evidentiary. Yeah, uh, that okay. is even you're, you're holding these laws of physics to be uh, constant. Um, any possible world that we could imagine would entail the level that is, so, that is being so, so Simon's point is, if you combine the laws of physics plus the data readings, the meter readings, that's a big plus. 
put those together, yeah. then you can get the existence of the Higgs boson. That's right. Okay? But, of course, we are not talking about the role of the boundary conditions in determining the uh, causal uh, order and levels of reality. So is, is, it, is it logical or is it causal? Is we this could be, it's not, it's causal, not logical. It's not true that logical if, a, if the dials read that, then it must be that there's a Higgs boson. You could be taunted by an evil demon. It could be an accident. You could be a brain in a bat. Uh -huh. It's not the same logical relation that if the particles are doing what they're doing, then we call that that psychology. Okay. okay. Back to what you said in response to sort of your attempt to triangulate uh, between the two of us over here. Isn't what you said um, essentially am amounting to a huge promissory note on behalf of your metaphysics that it's never going to be cashed out? I mean, you're saying, yeah, it should be possible to do that, and we're never going to do it, but trust me. Well, it sounds like a mini no, Romney plan it's, it's for the economy. Than, that's, what I, that's why I was disagreeing with you, because I think it's okay. stronger than that. I think okay. that the dynamics at the lower levels, I don't want to call them low, the microscopic, the more comprehensive theories, mm. are autonomous. So there is some answer to the question if you take every atom that makes up a person and reconstitute in exactly the same version somewhere else, what will happen? Mm -hmm. And that answer is unique if you believe the laws of atomic physics. And therefore, either the higher level is entailed, or the laws of atomic physics are wrong. Those are your only two choices. Mm -hmm. there's, no, no, it's there's possible. A, there's a relation that hasn't been discussed yet, or if it has, I've missed it. I expect that most of us think that we don't know that there aren't alternative life chemistries. So now, a very interesting question is, if we went to another planet in another galaxy and found life forms with a different chemistry, would we expect, nevertheless, that their economics would be the same <laughs> and that their psychology would be the same? The question is That's the question about, about whether the special sciences have generalizations which are not... Are see, the, the model we've been working with is a sort of uh, entailment of, of the chemistry by the physics and the biology by the chemistry and then on <laughs> up to the poetry. That's a sort of very simplistic idea of, of naturalism. And there's this other possibility that you can get, depending on initial conditions basically, or local conditions, you can get divergent mid-level theories. What's fascinating is the question of even though you get divergent mid-level theories, you might get convergent This sounds very much like Jerry Fodor. Right. Well, and there's another... Well, well, ooh, ooh. well that, 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 you know how to hurt a guy. Well, I meant it's only fair. There's another, there's another problem. There's something else that's wrong, I think, with the simplistic picture that Dan's identified. It, it, it's that all of our talk about... I mean, your example, Sean, exactly falls into the problem, I think, right? That, um, all the... It's compositional in the sense that it's all inside-out dependent, um, right? It may well be that those the 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 you've got a part. You're, you're assuming basically that you can draw boundaries around the organism, or maybe the organism in some space, right. some part of its environment, um, and now lift that out of context and and you know to take just those atoms and put them somewhere. And we'll get. But of course, we know that psychological generalizations about people are heavily dependent on the environment. Well, how much of the environment? Yeah. I mean, maybe you have to like reproduce the whole. You know, maybe you have to reproduce the whole universe, right? I, I think uh, that if I produced, you know, several million light years across, it would be okay. Well, but but you know, th but notice that these are that's a strict. These are strictly empirical issues now, right? They're not. They're not conceptual. Um, no, I would I would argue that if you think that the standard law, standard model of particle physics plus general relativity is right and within its claimed domain of applicability, every, what we're saying follows. I don't think it's optional. I mean, maybe those laws are wrong, but I think they predict something that is compatible with the, the thermodynamics and psychology we observe. And this, you know, you better give me a really good argument to doubt. But, but, all right, let, let me change the, change the focus slightly. So one of the reasons I'm resisting associating the fundamental physical laws with micro laws is because right, the explanation for why, for example, um, uh, we have the atomic structure, why, 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 why atomic physics is it as it is, 
likely involved, you know, I mean, involves the history of the whole universe since the Big Bang, right? It's not a, um, right? I mean, it's, it's constraints on the possibilities for matter, right, that are general properties of the universe that sort of explain why we have... We generally, I'm not, maybe I'm missing what you mean, we generally think that, let's say, the uh, size of a hydrogen atom in its lowest energy state is utterly independent of the history of the universe. So the existence of such things is obviously very dependent on the history of the universe, but if I set up the problem that way, I don't think the history comes in. So this, this brings up, I think, something that we have not distinguished well. And that is, as I listen to physicists or people talking from a physics point of view, I have a conception of emergence uh, or non-emergence that is synchronic. That is, oh, this is the way the world is, and there's the small parts and the big parts, and they're all linked together. Um, the term emergence, uh, I think, implicitly is about time, uh, and where history matters. Certainly in biology, history matters. Uh, biology is about the accumulation of constraints and differences, and accidents, for that matter, uh, and how the accidents change the conditions for the future. Uh, history matters in that sense. I, one of the problems I have is I don't... I don't actually think that a concept of emergence makes a lot of interesting sense synchronically. I do think it makes a lot of sense diachronically, across time, as things change. When we say something is new, I'm not talking about something is new up at a higher level versus a low level. It wasn't here before. Why wasn't it here before? Why wasn't it expressed in the preconditions? Why is it expressed in the postconditions? So I don't actually... Everything I've heard does not bother me because I don't see any incompatibility between you know the fundamental laws of physics. I'm not so would we still assuming. Have new, would we still have newness if we had the fundamental dynamical laws of uh, of physics plus the initial conditions at the Big Bang, such that dynamically, diachronically, various properties not hitherto instantiated were instantiated, but in accordance with a strict nomological determination. Right. Would, so that, that, would, that, would that constitute emergence no. and that's new history? No, the last, yeah. word, yeah. the last word you used was the one that I would be troubled by, as determined. Um, obviously, if accident matters, and if the base of the world, we don't have true determinant base of the world, whatever your bottom line is, if accident is part of the nature of the world at its lowest level, uh, then, in fact, I don't see determinism in the sense that you're talking about it. I don't see that you could... You see, no, you see novelty. Yeah, I see novelty. novelty. And the question is, if novelty exists at that level and it's cumulative, as it's historical, um, just like it is in evolutionary biology, then I don't see how you can make that claim. I don't see how you can say, yes, I can, I can go back to the Big Bang and, and wind it forward again. Yes, if I knew every single possible quantum accident, yes, I probably could. Uh, but in fact, uh, I don't you think can. that's the case. And where does that leave us in terms of new laws? No, I don't think, so I want to say I don't think the idea of new universal laws is the right way to think about it. Um, I think new historical conditions are the ways to think about it. I think that new complexes of constraints so that the laws aren't expressed the same way on the planet Earth as they are on the, pla on the planet Mars. Um, I think that's what's different, and that's why we have the kinds of differences we have here. I think that's a historical contingency issue. But that suggests that the laws of economics, let's say, are nothing new there. They're everywhere. They're, but some planets, yeah. Yeah. There, yeah. there's never any instantiation, yeah. and others it comes along here and it comes along there yeah. and that gets back to my question of couldn't it be the case that on one planet uh, from a historical accident they went through a carbon based life form then they went through a sort of singularity <coughs> thing and they made they made a, a silicon electronic robotics uh, agents that were first their their avatars, their surrogates and then the carbon based life dies out and you, got, you come to the planet, and it's all silicon-based forms, re replicating, and so forth. And the economics holds. Mm -hmm. I mean, law of supply and demand still holds. Mm -hmm. uh, and now, that suggests that the laws of economics really aren't <coughs> dependent on being walked up through chemistry. And, I mean, there's, historically, they're walked up through, but... but if if they're going to if they're going to turn out to be uh, applicable 
independently of the chemistry of the life forms, then, then we've got an interesting fact. No, since I don't you're talking agree. about that, it's we already have that question. situation with thermodynamics, uh, which applies in such an incredible variety of circumstances, or what Massimo was talking about, the theory of phase mm -hmm. transitions. I mean, we have, or geometry, uh, plain geometry, we have lots of formalisms which are uh, portable, and they can be generated in a variety of contexts, and they have a kind of internal consistency, but you can think of them simply as mathematical formalisms, and whether they apply or not it depends on uh, the more fundamental substratum. I mean, you have the silicon-based life forms, and they compete with each other, and they need nourishment, and so they practice economics. No, no. And carbon-based life forms similarly that's, compete and need nourishment, and so they practice economics. Yeah, that's my, that's my idea. And it's the well, same economics, but it means that economics is not an independent, free-floating science, which... Uh, but it's not free-floating. You're not talking about free-floating. Right? I wasn't talking about it being yeah. free-floating. Well, I just meant that it wasn't... It doesn't it wasn't pose, it doesn't, pose, no, it, is, well, it doesn't pose any problem.